All right, so on to chapter 14. So aggregate supply and demand. So we've done our you know, sort of civic duty up until now, right? Remember, what are the three goals of the macro economy? Full employment. Full employment. Stable prices. Stable prices. What about it? Economic growth. Okay, and how do we measure economic growth? GDP. How do we measure employment? <laughs> the unemployment rate. How do we measure stable prices? <laughs> CPI. Okay. <laughs> you start listening to NPR, right? As soon as you start listening to NPR, you'll hear that crap all the time, whether you like it or not. Sometimes it's annoying, but it's good at the same time. All right, so, so we've set the table. Now we actually have to start eating off the table. Yeah, she's got it going. All right, so aggregate supply and demand. As soon as you hear supply and demand, what do you guys think? Grass. Grass. It's going to happen. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> April Fool's. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, not April Fool's. Damn it. Okay, so before we get to the graph, though, let's think about what does it mean to talk about aggregate supply and demand. What does the phrase aggregate mean? What does hmm? aggregate? What does it mean? An accurate no. You're on the right track, but what does aggregate mean? It doesn't mean. But what does aggregate? What does the word aggregate mean? What do you do when you aggregate? Sort of stir it up, but it's not. It's more. It aggregate function is uh, when you use one thing to help another thing. Mm, kind of, but, but, but if like if I asked you what's the aggregate score of everybody in this class, what would you do with all the scores? Aggregate. No, that would be the average. This is the aggregate. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys literally don't know that. Kyle, look up the word aggregate and read the definition to us. Yeah, get off Facebook. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Type in the word aggregate and tell us what it means. <laughs> Darn you, people. I know what it means because I know how to aggregate. <laughs> exactly. The total, the sum to aggregate is to add everything up. <laughs> okay, so aggregate is the total of, all right, or the sum of. So you're kind of right that it's sort of like the stirring up of things, but it's not stirring, it's mixing them all in and then stirring them all up, right? So, you know. <laughs> all right, so. What then does aggregate demand mean? The total of all of the demand. The total of all demand, right? So aggregate demand. And from now on, I will not write out that phrase. What do you think I'm going to write instead? A total demand. AD a will represent aggregate demand. This is the sum of demand for all goods and services. So you know, think about the demand curve you would draw for corn. Think about the demand curve you would draw for oil. Think about the demand curve you would draw for you know, shoes. Add them all up. It would be a nasty line, right? OK. Now, obviously, in this class, I don't care about numbers often that much. So I'm probably not going to put numbers on it. But the idea is there. That's what you would be trying to do, add all of the demand curves up. OK. so. What do you think the demand curve is going to look like? Bowed out. <laughs> Bowed what bows out, everybody? A PPC. A PPC curve. Bow <laughs> so what does the demand curve look like? The left half of an X. <laughs> the left half of an X. That's actually not. <laughs> Booze. Booze out. <laughs> Scares you to the outside or something along those lines. All right. 
So if I if I said these were my axes and I asked you to draw a regular old demand curve, what would you draw? From the top, from the left, to the right. All right. So the nice part about it is that a demand curve, whenever you're asked to draw a demand curve, this is always what a demand curve looks like. So when I talk about the aggregate demand curve, it's still going to look like that, okay? The nice part about it is that whenever you're asked to draw demand, it's always the same thing, okay? It's, it's always this, bam. Right, so, so we're not learning anything new here. You've already done this once. Technically, we don't even really need to go over it because you know it already. Right? The problem with it is that it's a little bit hard to get your mind around the sum of all demand. Right? I mean, that's... Like numbers? Yeah. I mean, it's like you know, the, everything that you got in front of you, you demanded it at some stage. Right? So you know, whether it's the table, the pen, the, the Mountain Dew, the, the pencil case, the book, the folder, the paper. The shirt you're wearing, the how you got your hair cut, whether or not you're wearing glasses, the, you know, the jewelry you're wearing, the hat you're wearing, period. I mean, okay? So before we jump into it, let's sort of, you know, think about how we dealt with demand last time. So when we dealt with demand last time, I gave you a rule that said that there was an inverse proportion to the price and the quantity of a particular good, okay? That stuff remains the same. Now, the problem with aggregate demand is that before we were talking about price and quantity of a good. Now we need to talk about price and quantity of all goods. Well, crap. Can you just write a price up here for all goods? No. So how do we measure prices of all goods? <laughs> By aggregating, and then what do we do with the aggregate, right? So we, we would add up all of these prices, but what we really want to do is to figure out an average price. So maybe the general average price of all of the goods. And what do we use to measure the general average price level of all the goods? We use a market baskets of goods and convert to CPI. CPI. So the prices of all goods Instead of it being P up here, we need to have a, 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 a number that describes the prices of all of the goods. And that's what inflation gives us, or CPI. Because right? writing up the word inflation here is a pain in the ass. So instead, we write three letters, and they're C, P, and I. Okay. Now, that gives us the price. Down here, we want to have the quantity. What is the quantity of all goods and services produced in a year? Real GDP, right? So the big difference between drawing a regular demand curve and drawing an aggregate demand curve is that in a regular microeconomic demand curve, you've got price and quantity. In the aggregate world, you have to think of prices of all of the goods, that's inflation or CPI, or and the value of all of those goods or the quantity of all the goods that you're producing, which just is your real GDP, all right? And then you'll draw your demand curve, and instead of labeling it D, you will label it AD. So it sounded like we were going to get into something scary and, and potentially life-threatening, but it turns out, no. It's just a regular old demand curve. You just have to put an A in front of it. And remember how you define prices for everything and how you define quantity of everything, right? So really, it is exactly the same as the micro world, except we blew it up, right? We aggregated it. All right, so. Okay, so so let's assume that if CPI was 100, just I'm, again, this is me pulling numbers out of my uh, out of the air. If CPI is 100, let's assume that real GDP is 15 trillion dollars. If CPI goes up to 120, 
what happens to our real GDP? Real GDP goes down, and let's suppose it goes down to, say, $12 trillion, whatever. The, the numbers really don't matter. But the key here is realizing that higher prices lead to less GDP, right? And note that I didn't say higher prices lead to less demand, right? And you will avoid saying that as well, right? Always. Because we learned that back in Chapter 3, and we've learned very well not to ever say higher prices mean less demand. Higher prices mean less quantity demanded. Except here, it's a little bit easier to say it, right? When the prices are higher, our GDP goes down, right? So it's a little bit easier to, to get past that higher prices lead to less demand, right? If I said there was less demand, what would I have to do with the aggregate demand curve? I would shift it. So guess what we're going to have here in a little bit once we get to a movement of the demand curve. What did I always write in the upper right-hand corner up here? What, what were these things up here? Non-price non determinants. Or in this case, what's our price? CPI. Right, so this will be non-CPI determinants, right? And essentially, that's what we're doing. All right, so we'll get there, but we're not quite there yet. Eh, no, but they're real easy to remember, and I'll, you'll see why here in a little bit. All right, so, so you may look at this demand curve and you, you remember your micro life and you say, okay, demand was always like that. The reason that demand was like this, though, is because we said the law of demand, right, stated that when prices are higher, quantity is lower. There's an inverse relationship, right? Nowhere up here have I written a law of aggregate demand telling you that this relationship exists, okay? So you may ask me, okay, Marshall, you know, before we had a law, and laws make you, you know, I mean, definitive, right? When there's a law, you can say, okay, the police are going to come out and arrest me if I don't follow this law, right? Well, you didn't tell me there was a law for this one. So why does aggregate demand slope downward to the right? Why doesn't it, you know, why isn't it flat? Or why isn't it straight up and down? Because we've already figured all that out from the demand GDP. Well, we did from the micro world. Yeah, well, you would say chapter three, chapter four. Come on, Marshall, you knew those things, all right? Well, Technically, there is some reasons why. Okay, so the reasons why, and the book spends a little bit of time on them, and I sort of like them, so I'm going to talk about them a little bit too. But realize that I'm actually not going to quiz you on these things, okay, or test you. So one of the things is called the real balances effect, right? The real balances effect, right? So the, what this means is assume you have a fixed in, income. So imagine that your, your parents or your grandparents, if you're really young, who's retired and now has a fixed income based on their social security level, right? Or their investments, if they had the wisdom to invest. If you have a fixed income, what happens when prices go up? You have to buy less, right? Higher prices, higher CPI means buy less product. If you buy less product, right, so if your consumer spending goes down, what happens to the money in the circular flow model? It slows down. It slows down. So less money flows to the businesses. If less money flows to the businesses, what happens? Less money goes to the factor market and flows back up to the households. Less money in the households means less <laughs> Less money flowing around the circle, right? So higher CPI means you buy less and demand for goods is less. So real GDP will fall. It is really familiar. It's essentially the same sort of a thing that we've been working for. All right, so that one you guys can see pretty straightforward. Well, there's another one that's in here, and this is what's known as the interest effect. So what happens when interest rates are higher? So when CPI goes up, remember that I told you that interest rates are affected by inflation, right? 
it, the real interest rate is whatever interest rate you're paid minus the inflation rate. So if CPI goes up and inflation goes up, what do interest rates have to do? They have to go up, right? Because remember that banks are always going to demand a positive interest rate so that they're always earning profit. I mean, banks are relatively notorious at earning profit. Right? When they don't earn a profit, they tend to close relatively quickly. All right? So when CPI is higher, interest rates will be higher. When interest rates are sitting up at 12 and 13 and 15 percent, are you more or less likely to buy big ticket items? Less, less right? Because if the interest rate is 15, 20 percent, are you going to buy a new car and have to pay 15 percent for three to five years? Are you going to go buy a new house that 30 years of interest at 10 to 12 percent? And that works the same way with businesses. Is a business likely to invest in a new factory if interest rates are going to be really high? That was like. Yeah, right. That's what I thought too. I mean, is there? Yeah. Everybody, please stay in your classroom. Oh, okay. If you say so. All right. <laughs> So if interest rates are higher, are we likely to spend more of our money or save more of our money? Save. Exactly. Interest rates will be higher, so consumers and businesses save instead of spend. And when we save, what happens to GDP? it actually suffers, right? Remember, to be an American, to be a really good, patriotic American, you should never save any of your money. You should always spend 100% of it on new products at all times only. I swear. Oh, yeah. Grr. <coughs> all right, so again, real GDP falls. And the last... Yep, the net exports effect. Remember that net exports, that's the difference between exports and imports, right? So think X minus M. When our prices are higher, so American prices are higher, our CPI goes up. Are we going to export more goods? If our prices are higher, are we going to sell to the foreign countries? Are foreign countries going to come to us and buy our more expensive goods? <laughs> we'll try and sell them, but the other countries are going to look at it and say, wait, your prices are 10% higher than ours? Same product? Uh, no thanks, right? Likewise, in our country, if our prices are going up, and we're looking to buy something, right? Are we likely to import the goods or not? Yeah, we are going to import the goods, right? Because it's going to be cheaper in the foreign countries where the prices haven't been going up, right? So the idea here is that our exports are going to go down, our imports are going to go up. <laughs> That's known as the double whammy, folks, right? Exports go down, so this number is lower. This imports go up, which means we're going to subtract a higher number yeah, uh-huh, we're hurting hardcore, right? So higher CPI will lead to less exports and more imports. So X minus M becomes a bigger negative number. X minus M is negative. And again, when X minus M is negative, that's a... One of the equations, one of the variables in our equation for GDP. So when this is negative, what happens to real GDP? Real GDP also falls. All right. So these are just the three standard reasons that economists are going to tell you that 
regular old aggregate demand should be this downward sloping demand curve, just like, okay, it's not a law, though. Right? It's not, you know, this is the way it's going to be no matter what, cateris paribus. It's, it's more along the lines of think about the way the entire economy works, and because of that, intuit for yourself that this is the way aggregate demand is going to look. All right? All right. I'm going to leave it alone at that. <laughs> All right, so again, please remember that if CPI goes up or down, real GDP will go up or down in the inverse fashion. All right, again, you will resist the attempt to say that when prices go up, demand goes down. You will not say that, right? So, so what moves the aggregate demand curve or changes AD? So it's not prices, right? Prices do not change demand. Prices just change quantity. So please note that when I generally draw the graph, I will normally just write GDP here. Please realize that I always mean real GDP, OK? But writing the word real in here is going to, I'll probably misspell it half the time. So just, just let me write GDP, and that should be good, OK? All right, so we agree now that aggregate demand is a downward sloping to the right curve, or line, if you want to call it a line. And we know that when prices go down, it will go up. All right. Now, what is our equation for calculating GDP? What was that? C plus I plus G. We'll call this, this is, that's the formula for real GDP in general. Technically, normalize it afterwards or whatever, but this is our formulation for, real, for GDP in general. Now, the non-price or CPI determinants our first non-price determinant is Consumer spending. That's number one. How will I abbreviate it? Yeah. Even easier than that, folks. This is just C. And in fact, note, it's the same C as up here. Guess what my next non-price determinant's going to be? Uh, what does the I stand for? Business investment, thank you. <laughs> or I, guess what my third non-price determinant is? G, uh, government spending. Guess what my fourth non-price determinant? Hey, all right. <laughs> and my last and final. So the cool part about aggregate demand is that the actual non-price or non-CPI determinants of it are just the five letters that describe it anyways, all right? So if I tell you that consumer spending is on the rise, which is what we've been hearing for the past two months in our economy, that consumer spending is up, consumer confidence is up, C has been rising. Guess what's been happening to aggregate demand? It's been going up as well, right? If more consumers are coming to the product market and dropping money, what happens when that money drops into the, into the product market? Goes to the businesses. What do the businesses do with it? Go down to the factory market, hire more people, put more money into the households, more money goes to the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? What happens when businesses get more money, when profits for businesses are way up? <laughs> this one's a little bit trickier, right? Because businesses for the last four years have been sitting on tons of cash, okay? 
businesses haven't really hurt too much throughout this recession. The only people that have hurt through this recession have been consumers. Right? I mean, it's, it's really been people, not businesses. I mean, yeah, business profits dropped for like two months. But once businesses realized that they weren't making a profit, what did they do? No, they didn't lower prices. <laughs> they started holding their product. And when they started reducing their supply, right, or they didn't really reduce their supply. What they did was they said, well, I don't need to produce as much. What do businesses do when they don't need to produce as much? They lay off workers, right? So they, they reduce their costs is what they did. And that's where the whole unemployment rate came from. And once the businesses reduced their costs enough so that they were profitable again, they were perfectly fine. They were, you know, they were happy, right? I mean, you guys weren't, but. You blamed it on us because we weren't spending. Exactly. It's all your own fault. <clears throat> So when businesses quit spending and consumers quit spending, who picked up the slack? Government. Yeah, over the last three years, government spending has been higher than, than it has been over the past you know, 15, some 20 odd years as a percentage of GDP. Exports and imports for us always suck, folks. We always import way the hell more than we export, period. We've been negative balance of trade for since World War II, basically. Right. We don't owe China all that much, really. Most of the most of the money in our in our national debt we actually owe ourselves. ourselves yeah. yeah. I mean, it's mostly it's just the old people that that are collecting social security or will be collecting social security in the near future who are bankrupting us. If we just had a really good disease came through and wiped out most Ooh, of the people over yeah. 65, this country'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not 65, so it wouldn't bother me. But uh, you know. But these are the things that, that shift aggregate demand. All right, so if I, all right, so, um, explain what happens to aggregate demand when? And I'm going to give you some, some economic you know, news, right? So um, let's start with something that's relatively straightforward. Uh, consumer confidence is on the rise. So here's, you know, you're driving in to, to school, and you turned on NPR for however long you, you know, it takes you to get to school. It's got to take you at least a little bit of time because there are no houses anywhere near this place. So you got to be on the road for at least five minutes, right? Wasn't yesterday faster? Was it slower? I know. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> and the worst part, if you, if you ever listen to NPR and they start talking about a list, they start listing something out. So if they started to list out the non-price determinants of, 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 you know, of aggregate demand, this is how they would do it. They would say, the non-price determinants for aggregate demand are, one, consumer spending, two, Business investment, three, government spending, four, exports, five, import. Always the volume tails off at the end. It's like the person is dying who's giving the report, and they can't, they don't have enough air to actually speak what they're trying to say. It's, it's to tell my wife that was the one reason why I didn't like NPR. We were driving to Iowa at the time. It's like a five and a half hour drive, so we used to listen to NPR for a long time. They get all quiet. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. This, and literally, two seconds after I said that, this guy was giving a list of trees that were running into disease problems. He started listing them off. And, and sure enough, he, like, elm, oak, pine, uh, and he just, I mean, just, and he said like three more trees. I'm like, I can't even freaking hear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm looking at her, just going, shut up, shut up. Just turn it up when they do that. But, but then, turn it up. So then what happens then? Oh no, but hey, it's but it's so much fun to listen to NPR. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so when consumer confidence is on the rise, what happens to aggregate demand? AD rises, or if I ask you to describe what happens to the graph, it's gonna move to the right. It's gonna shift to the right. Shift. A, D to the right, yes, 
Exactly. So suppose I tell you something like um, uh, government plans, plans with two, with two S's, no, plans to um, cut spending to balance the budget. Right, great idea. This is what we all want to have happen. If government cuts spending, what happens to aggregate demand? Yes, right? Aggregate demand is going to fall or shift AD to the left. Normally, you guys, back in the micro world, what happened when demand fell? Was that good for businesses? <laughs> Very rarely. Guess what happens when aggregate demand falls for the economy? It tends to fall as well. Again, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But do realize that if we were to try and balance the budget and we were worried about the economy not doing well, this ain't going to help. All right. Um, let's suppose that I say uh, you hear that imports are on the rise. So the economy is recovering, so we're importing more goods into this economy. Yes. Remember, right? What's the letter in front of imports? Exactly, right? This is the one that you have to be careful with with aggregate demand. Right? When imports go up, this is the only one that has an inverse relationship between aggregate demand and its non-price determinant, right? All these other ones, if any of these go up, aggregate demand goes up. If any of these go down, aggregate demand goes down. This is the only one that's back asterisk. AD falls or shifts left. OK, and of course, one last one. Uh, you hear that uh, CPI falls from 105 to 103. So what happens to aggregate demand? Nothing. Nothing. Right. Nothing happens to aggregate demand. We will shift to a new point on aggregate demand. So if you wanted to get extra credit at this stage, you could say, ah, we will move to a new point on the aggregate demand curve. But aggregate demand itself does not change. Right. Changing prices does not change demand. All right? And a change in CPI is just a change in price. So move to a new point on aggregate demand. Okay, so that's the valid correct answer, right? Think about think back to the midterm questions three and four, right? Or two and three, whichever one it was. All right, so there is aggregate demand. Any questions about aggregate demand? No, that's only half of it. Here, aggregate demand and aggregate supply are both in Chapter 14. So if we have aggregate demand, what do we need next? Aggregate supply. Oh, lovey dovey, wonderifico. All right, now, unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you look at it, aggregate supply is much more complicated than it was in the regular supply world. Well, you don't want things to be exactly the same. If it was exactly the same, then it would just be boring. You guys don't like boring. I know you guys. If it was easy, everybody would do it. All right, so. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. It's kind of dead. All right, so. Aggregate supply. Again, this is the sum of all supply. Now, this one is a little bit different, OK? 
Okay. Supply is dependent on the condition of the economy. So it turns out that aggregate supply actually has three different stages or three different phases, if you want to you know, call it that. We are going to call this AS, yes. So when you label your aggregate supply curve, you will label it AS. The nice part about it is, is that you're still dealing with CPI and real GDP, right? I mean, anytime you're talking about aggregate anything, whether it's supply or demand, you're always talking CPI, real GDP. All right, now, aggregate supply has three different stages based on what the economy is doing, all right? So the first stage, or what's commonly considered the first stage, it's called the Keynesian, think Keynesian. So think, you know, the Keynes, Miami, right? right? It's not the Keynesian, it's the Keynesian. Even though it's spelled with a K-E-Y, it's Keynes. This guy's Maynard Keynes, he was an a, a English economist who was studying the American economy back in the 30s, right, right around our Great Depression. Okay, and he was one of the very first economists to come up with an actually a new economic theory. All right, so Maynard, again Maynard, great name, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> All right, he proposed that there was a different way of looking at the supply curve for the economy that we were in. It used to be prior to this that most economists were classical economists, which we will get to at the end of the stage. But Keynes said, When the economy is in a bad recession, or, heaven forbid, a depression, this is a certain stage of aggregate supply. Right? The idea behind it here is, imagine, if you will, you're in a really bad depression or you're in the Great Recession, right? So think about yourself two years ago. Now, or for those of you who are old enough, think about yourself 70 to 80 years ago. Because that was when the Great Depression was, right? So, you, 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 you guys all remember your prior selves, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I believe in the reincarnation aspect of some religions and therefore I was someone else back in that time. So. All right, anyways, when we're dealing with a great recession or a depression, right, normally in that stage, there's high levels of unemployment, right? <laughs> unemployment was nasty two years ago, right? Okay, so when it came time for you to look for a job, how picky were you about which job you'd take? Not at all. Not flipping at all, right? No matter what you were thinking, once unemployment ran out, you're like, as long as this job pays me something so that I can eat and I can survive and you know maybe even pay some of my bills, I'm taking it. Right? So you weren't all that picky. So wages are low due to loss of jobs. When wages are low, Right, you get a job, consumer spending is relatively flat, what are happening to prices? Prices are actually dropping, right? Since wages are low, businesses don't need higher prices for profit, right? Normally, when it comes time to hire somebody, they're going to have to pay them 25, 30 bucks an hour to do a particular job. What's happened to those 25 to 30 dollar an hour jobs that used to exist five years ago? They're either no more or the wages have been cut by 40 to 50 percent, right? If you find someone out there who's a, a journeyman welder who used to be making 25, 30, 40 dollars an hour, now they're lucky if they're making 25 bucks, 20 dollars an hour, right? 
And that's exactly what the businesses have been doing, right? They've been going out there saying, oh, yeah, we need somebody to come back to Stoughton Trailer and work for, you know, 90 days here at our particular company. And yeah, we're going to pay you $12.50. Used to be they would pay you $21.75, right? Why would they advertise the job at $12.50? Because because anybody's going to take it. We were in a great recession, right? People were desperate. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, they, they can be picky, right? Yeah. Right. But if they get 2,000 applications for a 10-people job, right, what do they get to do, right? I mean, there's 2,000 people who are willing to work at Stone Trailer for 12.50 an hour. Yeah, they can find the ones that they like most and say, great, come on, work here for 12.50 an hour, right? And while this recession was going on, Stoughton Trailer was not necessarily hurting all that much. I mean, they, their profits were down a little, but that was simply because demand was farther away enough down to, to screw with their actual sale. Once demand even picked up a little bit, Stoughton Trailer was doing just fine. Same thing for most of the other businesses in the area. Right? Once they got their wages way down, they were in like Flynn, man. Business profits are up, have been for the past three years. Just that half year to three quarters of a year, the business profits were down. Right? So the key here is that if wages are down and prices are staying down, so if wages aren't changing, right? So the key here is that during a recession, low. So we're closer to this end of the GDP spectrum, right? We're over here. But the idea is that in order for GDP to go up, right? So when those people get a $12.50 an hour, $12.50 an hour job, what are they doing with the money they earn? Are they saving it? Can they save it? <laughs> no, they still have to pay for all the stuff that they had to buy before. And prices haven't gone down very much. We had a very little bit of deflation for a while, but prices have stayed roughly the same. So they used to be making 20 bucks an hour and when they were making 20 to 25, yes, they could save, but when they're making 12.50, uh -uh, they spend, right? And again, as soon as they spend, where does the money go? Right into the circular flow, right? So the money keeps flowing. The money flows to the business. The business comes back and it says, well, yeah, we've got a little bit more money. We can hire a few more people at twelve fifty an hour. Sure we can. Eventually those twelve fifty dollars you know, so Stoughton would then say, okay, so we, we got another 10 openings. Who wants in? Now they get another 2,000 applications, twelve fifty an hour. Etc. Right. So the idea is that GDP starts to grow a little bit, but do prices grow with it? No, because the businesses don't have to, because you guys aren't demanding a higher wage yet. So the idea here is that that first stage of aggregate supply is actually flat. Right. So once the Great Recession turns around, right, once enough people say, okay, I'm not going to stay on unemployment, I'm going to take this $12.50 an hour job, they start producing things. Once those things are produced, GDP starts to go up. Well, once GDP goes up, that means businesses are getting a little bit more money, which means they hire a few more people, so GDP will go up a little bit more. And as it goes up, as it keeps traveling and traveling over here, the cool thing about it, for Stoughton Trailer at least, is that they can keep hiring people at $12.50 an hour. Eventually, though, what happens? Yeah, right. Or, or <laughs> they put out an advertisement for twelve fifty an hour. Do they get two thousand applications? No, they're out. What's no. Yeah, all of those people are looking for fifteen dollars an hour now, and so Stoughton's like, well, crap. We only got a hundred people applying for these ten jobs we offered at twelve fifty, and they looked at the applicants and they said, do we want to hire any of these? No, these are people who are filling out forms so they keep getting unemployment. Crap. So they don't hire 10 people. So what do they have to do? They have to raise the wages. They have to say, crap, we have to start advertising for $15 an hour. Son of a, right, for, for Stoughton, right? Because, <laughs> but if wages go up, what do they have to do to the price of their trailers? To raise them up a little bit, all right? So the idea here is that this stage is the Keynesian stage, where GDP may go up because We've turned the corner, but prices stay fixed. But eventually, we turn the corner, right? Or we hit a corner. And we start to go back to a regular old supply curve, where in order for them to hire more people, they actually have to pay a little bit more. But once they start paying a little bit more, they also have to raise their prices a little bit more, right? That's known as the intermediate stage. 
And this is when the economy is, quote unquote, recovering. from recessions. And it can be from any kind of a recession. It doesn't have to be a great recession or a great depression. Whenever we're in the intermediate stage, we are in that stage where in order for the companies to, to, to make a little bit more profit, they probably have to raise their prices because they have to keep paying people more. Right? And again, paying them does not necessarily mean more money. It just means more cost. So it could be that OK, they may be still hiring people for $15 an hour, but now they actually offer you benefits to go along with it. right? They'll say, well, OK, we'll pay you $15 an hour, and we'll put you on the company benefits. Right? What, what Stoughton Trailer is still doing right now is paying them $15 to $18 an hour with zero benefits. Right? You work for 89 days, because if you work for less than 90 days, it's illegal for a company to not offer benefits. So that's why lots of 89-day contract jobs exist in the business world right now. Right. Eventually, though, even Stoughton Trailer won't be able to do that. Right. They're still getting away with it right now, from what I've heard. Okay, 89-day contracts. Get to that 90th day, though, then they're going to have to pay you health benefits in some fashion, either as a, as a, a cash benefit or actually offer it to you in, in the hiring process by law. So right. no just for that many years? Not a lot of people. From them, at least right now. And that's because they're the recovery stage. If we're anywhere in the economy right now, we're, we're somewhere right along right there. We're, we're on that stage of recovery. We're recovering from the recession. Prices are starting to go up a little bit. Wages are also going to go up a little bit. Please realize that prices and wages always go together, folks. Right? That's the first sign of a recovery. Most economists, when they're looking at whether or not the economy is truly recovering, they'll say, well, yeah, consumers are spending more. Yeah, businesses are making more profit. Yeah, the, uh, the stock market's making more money. But what they're looking at is the inflation rate. Good economists will say, OK, all those other things have to change, and we have to start seeing prices go up. Because that's the stage where you guys have finally said, I ain't going to work at Stoughton Trailer for $12.50 an hour and no benefits. That's true consumer confidence. right? I can bypass that job because I can find a better one, maybe not closer to my house, but it's going to pay me $15 to $18 an hour and potentially even offer me some benefits. <laughs> I mean, still contract as long as they can. Now, as you recover, so as GDP keeps growing, right? So here's the intermediate stage. Eventually, <laughs> and this is a, a, a questionable eventually, we get back to the full recovery stage, all right? So eventually, everyone does have a job, right? So. Imagine, if you will, that the, that the unemployment rate goes back to 2006, 2007 levels, where it was like 4%, right? where essentially anybody who had a job or wanted a job could get one. Right? I mean, there were some people who were frictionally unemployed because they were between jobs. There were also some people who were seasonally unemployed because you know, they liked to only work six months out of the year, or nine, or whatever it is. Right? So there had to be some unemployment, just nothing that was problematic, no structural and no real cyclical. All right? So at some stage, we reach the full employment stage. And that is called the classical stage. All right? This is when the economy is at full employment. Yeah, look at, go another page. <coughs> Until you see the three stages. <laughs> the idea here is that this stage, when you have reached full employment, when everyone is being productive in your economy, everyone is working, right? You've reached full employment. You can't produce anything more. Now, Right? Imagine, if you will, that you know, some miracle occurs and that next year we reach full employment. Like, let's suppose that unemployment drops down to like 4% in, in three months. Okay, yeah, it's the military. <laughs> something along those lines. All right, so here, do, just because we have reached full employment, are you guys not looking for new jobs? No, we're looking for better jobs. We're looking for better jobs, right? Now, 
we're not necessarily looking for a better job, though, right? When you're at full employment, the idea here is that you have found the ultimate job, right? So the idea here is that you're, say, you're a teacher for Black Hawk Technical College, and you're saying, this is exactly what I wanted to be doing. I want to be a teacher, and I'm teaching here at Black Hawk Tech, and I'm, like, ecstatic to get it, right? So here I am teaching, and I'm like, woohoo! But three years ago, I was laid off. And I was thinking I was unemployed, and it was nasty, and it was terrible, and I was nervous and scared, and I had to live off my savings for a little while, blah, blah, blah. So three years later, I still remember that three years ago, right? And so I say to myself, okay, yeah, I have the ultimate job, but do I stop looking? No, of course not, because I may find another job somewhere else that's teaching, but they pay more, or it's closer to home, right? So you keep looking. And if I go to, say, Madison Area Technical College and get a job, I may get paid more. In fact, I would if I could get in, right? But would I be doing more? I mean, I'm still teaching. I will still be teaching the same classes. I'll still be teaching the same amount of time. So am I producing more? Yet, for some reason, I'm getting paid more. Does that mean I'm generating more GDP? No, not unless you're spending it. <laughs> I'm not generating any more real GDP. So what happens with growth when you're at full employment? Do you actually produce more? You stay the same, but prices just go up. Okay, so the key here is that GDP is fixed. It's never going to get past this stage. So if we grow in the classical environment, if we grow from here to here, what's the only thing that changes? Prices, right? So the growth at full employment, it can happen. It's just that it's not real. It's just money for doing the same thing. And that will just translate into inflation. All right? So these are the three stages of, of aggregate supply. So we should label it appropriately, right? This is aggregate supply. The three stages, Keynesian, intermediate, and classical. Right? And they are all really dependent upon what stage the economy is. Now, what dictates where you throw aggregate demand into this curve is strictly dictated by these three stages. Right? Right. So you know that I want to put aggregate demand in there with it, right? And, and now you have to say, well, where does it, where does it intersect aggregate supply? Because you know it's going to go down this way, so it's got to hit it somewhere. Well, where it hits is based on how did I set the table. So if I tell you that we're in the Great Depression or we're in a Great Recession, you will say that we are in the Keynesian stage. That, therefore, aggregate demand intersects aggregate supply somewhere in the Keynesian range. So if I said there was a Great Recession, you would put aggregate demand right there. If I told you that the, that the economy was recovering from a recession, and had been doing so for a couple of weeks, it's a relatively new recovery, you would say, oh, that's aggregate demand that's recovering, so it's intermediate, and it's relatively early, so it's closer to down here. Right? So the state of the economy just tells you where is equilibrium. That's all it's doing. Okay. So before, equilibrium was just you know, <laughs> supply and demand in the micro world. It was just where the two lines hit, you were good to go. Here, in the aggregate world, the state of the economy drives where they hit, OK? So it is regular aggregate supply and aggregate demand. It's just that aggregate supply is funky. And in being funky, the state of the economy drives where aggregate demand hits it, OK? How do you figure out whether you're in one of those stages? Because I will tell you what stage the economy is in. I will tell you we are in a great recession. We are recovering from a recession. We are at full employment, right? So the preface will be that I have to tell you what the economy is doing. I will always do it. If, if, you, if I don't, then you get to pick your own one, and, and you just have to tell me, ooh, I think we're in a recession. Therefore, aggregate demand is here in the Keynesian range. Okay. So how can you explain that in 40 years' time? Yeah, uh -huh. you would look at GDP and say, GDP has fallen three three quarters in a row or four quarters in a row. Therefore, we are in a recession, hardcore. So therefore, we must be somewhere around here. Where we are around here, <laughs> you know, you don't have an economics degree. I mean, I don't have an advanced economics degree, so I really don't even know. But I know we're down here somewhere. 
Right? And that's, again, what economists, the, 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 the high paid economists for the government, that's their job. They're trying to figure out how does this aggregate supply curve look, right? I mean, I'm going to draw it with nice sharp corners and very definitive terms. In the real world, it, it's much more fluid, right? If you look in the book even, they will often draw it like this. Right? They won't make it a three-stage effect. They'll actually just draw it a nice fluid curve and say, well, here's where we are. Okay? I am going to make it easier for you. They are definitive breaks. It's a point with a blink going into it. It's a little Justin Bieber, right? <laughs> isn't that what he does with his hair? He's got the little, isn't that him? Yeah, I don't know either. But <laughs> I agree, but he's got a point in his hair, so, so that's where aggregate supply looks for me, right? right? The book tries to get a little bit more hand wavy and talk about smooth curves and all this other crap. Eh. That's, that's too hand wavy. I don't want to be that way. I want to say, look, these are, this is it. If this is very mathy, right? Because I want it there to be three stages one, two, and three, and there's no, right? There's no curve going on. We don't want any curves, we want points. Yeah, well, I, always, I call straight lines a curve. To me, they're all the same. All right? All right, so. Nothing, nothing more new, but we're now we're going to have a couple of examples of aggregate supply and aggregate demand, and you guys are going to tell me where to put crap. Okay, so. Uh, um, so. So all I want you to do is to draw aggregate supply and aggregate demand. That's all I want to do for this particular stage right now. All right, so um, we are currently at full employment. So you know we're in the classical range. Now the question is, how do you draw it? And draw C. So when you are drawing aggregate supply and aggregate demand, folks, you must always draw aggregate supply first. Okay? You have to. So here's aggregate supply. And again, the state of the economy drives where aggregate demand hits aggregate supply. And where it hits aggregate supply, you just have to make sure in the correct range, but where within that range is entirely up to you. All right? So if you're going to draw aggregate demand in here, you could, if you wanted to, put it way up at the top of aggregate supply, or you could put it way down at the, at the end of that stage, whichever one makes you happier. Right? But the point of equilibrium for aggregate supply and aggregate demand hit has to be in the classical range. All right? Because, of course, in the very near future, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, oh, now an economic event occurs, and one of these curves is going to shift. And you're going to have to tell me, well, what happens? Right? Because the idea here is that I want you to tell me what happens to the three things we care about in the macro economy. What are the three things we care about in the macro economy? Full employment, Full employment economic growth, economic growth stable and, stable and stable prices. Right. So I'm going to ask you about economic growth, real GDP. I'm going to ask you about prices, CPI. I'm going to ask you about employment, and you guys will now tell me, well, that employment and GDP go hand in hand. So if, if GDP goes up, we will start to see economic growth. We will also start to see more employment. Right? So again, the goal of this, you know, the first five or six chapters of this part of the class is what's going to happen to the economy. Potentially. Uh-huh. 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 All right. So let's try another one. Again, not, we're not there yet. That's, I'm saving that for, for, for uh, next class. All we're doing right now is setting the table, right? But you should. Yeah, uh-huh. As long as we're full employment, who cares? Right? 
in, in theory. We'd be a little nervous because the prices were too high. But all right, so let's try another one. Um, uh, You mean if you're just going up this direction? Eventually, yeah, because what will end up happening is that the really, really high prices will eventually s slip you into hyperinflation. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we pushed ourselves a lot to it. I mean, there were some, we'll get to that. There's a little bit of other things that were going on at the time. but. But yeah, we were floating around here up at full employment, and then all of a sudden something crashed, aggregate demand, and it And then what happened was that, of course, Herbert Hoover in his infinite wisdom raised corporate taxes. So he shifted aggregate supply to the left to try and fix things, and it, it just broke it. It made it worse. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, uh huh, yeah. Okay, so we are um, um, just recovering. From recession. Again, get yourself in the habit of labeling the axes, CPI and GDP. Always start with aggregate supply. And in this case, we are just recovering from a recession. You need to make sure we're somewhere in the intermediate stage which, of course, is the upward sloping stage. And again, where you put the curve is really entirely up to you. As long as you're in the right range, I'm happy. But really, if I say just recovering, you should probably put it closer to the Keynesian range than you are to the classical range. You just recovered. Yep, exactly. If I say we have been recovering from a recession for a while, then you may want to start moving it. All right. This is about half of chapter 14, folks. So the rest of chapter 14 is, of course, moving aggregate supply and aggregate demand. What happens? All right. And of course, we haven't really talked about the non-price determinants of aggregate supply yet either. Which so then the quiz is over 13? Tomorrow's quiz is over 12 and 13. Well, Wednesday, whatever. The next class. Next class is always tomorrow for me. Yes, the quiz on Wednesday will be 12 and 13. Yes. No homework. No. If you haven't finished chapters 12 and 13 homework, that's your homework. Otherwise, there is no new homework today. We will, you will get chapter 14's homework on Wednesday. <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. I am not a smart ass. I'm a normal person just like everybody else. I'm gonna let you think that. See, just like everybody else. That's right. When I when I go to the bathroom, I'm happy it flushes just like everybody else. Then don't leave me downstairs girls' bathroom ever. <laughs> Wait, you, you avoid all outdoor male porta potties. Uh, <laughs> at Rush, they are always have our porta potties. Thanks, Amanda. Especially when it's 110 degrees out and 500 cast members and you just don't even. Yeah, sit don't even think about it. Of course, even those. Even the women's ones are gross nowadays because, oh. of course, women hover when they're in a potty and it's you like, oh, to. great. You kind of have to. Because I think many women believe that's how you get the fish. <sighs> I sent you a very sarcastic, smart ass comment on, or uh, message on Facebook this morning. I think your father saw this. I sent him. <laughs> he was like, oh, technology dropped you on Facebook. You're not for the first time. <laughs> Cool. I have a brownie. Okay. Yeah, I love brownies. <laughs> Doesn't taste very good though. It's kind of dry. Need some sugar. Did you see that? Did you see that? 
Is it a casino? Where? Oh, oh, okay. Up north, you mean? Up north, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, at least that way it'll stick. <laughs> A moment on the lips. Hmm. All right, let's prep the next one. <laughs> what? I. <laughs> I know it's fun. <laughs> Sorry about that. 